Right. Welcome, everybody, and uh, thank you for joining. Um, my name is Spencer Allingham, and I'm the Technical Director at Conducive Technologies EMEA. Um, we're going to talk about the new DiskKeeper 16 for physical servers and PCs today. And uh, so let's, let's jump straight in. Let's, let's go for it. Oh, um, while, while we're going through, uh, just a quick housekeeping note. If you have any questions that crop up as, you, as, uh, as they're coming through, um, feel free to put them into the, uh, into the Q&A box uh, on the side, and I'll, I'll have a look at the end. And uh, if there are any questions, we can have a Q&A session uh, at the end and try and get as many of those answered as we can. Right. So as some of you may know, we've been around for more than 30 years. Uh, we sold an awful lot of licenses in that time and really become the experts in Windows file system performance. In fact, some of the technology in DiskKeeper and our Velocity product for virtualized environments has been licensed to some of the top hardware manufacturers in the world. Um, and I'm talking about hardware companies like Samsung, HP, Dell, Lenovo, and some storage companies like SanDisk and Western Digital. And they use this technology to make their products run faster and stay running really fast. And we've enjoyed a deep relationship with Microsoft at an engineering level since the mid-90s. Um, and we're also a VMware Technology Alliance partner. We do also have a, a similar solution to DiskKeeper, as I mentioned, for virtualized environments called Velocity. And for that reason, Gartner's, uh, Gartner gave us the Call Vendor Award and recommended that our Velocity software be deployed with every Windows virtualization in initiative, which is a pretty cool thing for them to say. Um, but enough about who we are. Let's, let's roll up our sleeves and, and talk about the new DiskKeeper 16. So for several decades now, we've been selling and supporting the DiskKeeper software in abundance. It's quite usual when I visit a, a new IT department for the first time to find someone who's either using DiskKeeper or has used DiskKeeper in the past. Now, we've sold over 100 million licenses all over the world to customers who simply wanted to prevent that age-old problem of Windows machines slowing down over time. However, we want to shout from the rooftops that DiskKeeper is no longer a defragmenter. And if you take anything away from this presentation, let it be that. Defrag is a thing of the past. And we agree that an old school defragger should really have no place in today's physical and virtual Windows machines. In fact, running an old school defrag on today's terabyte sized volumes can be very detrimental. For example, it can make snapshots much larger than they actually need to be. It can add extra overhead to things like replication, deduplication, and copy on write. And it can be quite alarming if you're not prepared for this additional overhead. So as mentioned, today's disk keeper is not a defragmenter. Sure, it can prevent fragmentation from occurring, but that is very different from allowing fragmentation to occur only to then have to waste time and system resource bringing the fractured parts of files back together again. It's far better to prevent the problem from occurring in the first place so that data is written correctly the first time in nice, large, sequential writes. And this is a much more efficient way for storage I.O. traffic to be presented to the storage underneath and allows the storage the opportunity to create larger, more sequential stripes across its media using fewer storage level operations. So DiskKeeper 16 makes defrag a thing of the past. So just what have we done to, dis to make DiskKeeper 16 so special for its 30th anniversary? Well, as mentioned in the previous slide, we prevent fragmentation from occurring in the first place. We've introduced a new RAM caching technique, which really turbo boosts those storage hungry applications like SQL Server, SharePoint, Exchange, business information and CRM systems, file servers and the like, anything that's storage hungry. We have a new reporting system that will actually show you just how much storage IO time you're saving. And we guarantee to fix the toughest performance problems on your physical servers, workstations, or laptops, or we will give you your money back. 
no quibble, no question. We want you to experience what today's disk keeper can do for you, and we want to remove any risk from the equation. If for some reason you don't like it, we will simply give you your money back. And that's how confident we are that you will like what you'll see. So storage is typically the slowest part of any IT infrastructure. Disk keeper reduces the reliance on the storage by reducing the amount of storage IO packets that have to be generated and sent down to the storage. Each storage IO that has to be generated takes a measurable amount of time and resource to process. It's a bit like saying on this side of the room, I've got a liter of water, which is my data, and I need to move it to the other side of the room, which is where my storage is. It's much more efficient to make one trip with a liter sized jug than it is to take that same amount of water and pour it into lots of tiny paper cups and then move the first paper cup across the room and then come back and take the next paper cup across the room and then come back and take the next paper cup across the room and so on. Paper cup sized IOs make everything work so much harder than it needs to in order to process the same amount of storage data. Disk Keeper helps Windows perform better by preventing these split IOs. This also prevents file fragmentation from occurring, which is why we say it makes defrag a thing of the past. So new to Disk Keeper is, the, is this new RAM caching feature. And this further helps to reduce the reliance on the slower storage underneath by using some of the idle available RAM to serve some of the storage IO traffic. And this has two main benefits. One, RAM is faster than the storage. It's roughly 10 to 15 times faster even than SSDs and flash. So the traffic that can be satisfied from the cache is done so much faster than the storage ever could. And this helps those storage hungry applications to do more work in the same amount of time, quite simply because they're not having to wait so much on the storage before being able to get on with their next operation. But the second thing is that the storage IO traffic that's satisfied from the RAM cache within the Windows operating system is traffic that gets offloaded away from the storage. And this frees up very valuable storage IO bandwidth for the rest of the traffic that does still have to flow out to the storage. So by reducing the amount of write IOs required and reducing the amount of read IOs required, you can see how Disk Keeper can improve the performance of the machine by providing less work for the slowest part of the infrastructure to deal with. So let's take a look at some results from people who were testing the new Disk Keeper 16 with the RAM caching. And this, this really is, is more on the endpoints. So this is client operating systems like Windows 10, Windows 7, Windows 8, and, and so on. And I'll, I'll get onto the server results in a, in a moment. So we tested Disk Keeper using an industry standard PC Mark Microsoft Office productivity test on a mid-range laptop. Some of you may know PC Mark. They're, they're fairly well known. It's a, an independent uh, software testing utility that you can download and, and purchase and, and reproduce for yourself if you want to, these tests. So you can clearly see that the test shows that Microsoft Office is able to be more productive when Disk Keeper is present. It can get more work done in the same amount of time, 73% more. Another PC Mark test shows Microsoft Office startup times. Just look how much faster it is to open things like Word, Excel, and PowerPoint when Disk Keeper is present and its RAM cache can, can do what it needs to. One final PC Mark lab test showed that Disk Keeper is able to provide more storage IO bandwidth, even than the previous version of Disk Keeper 15. And this is because it now has that additional RAM caching feature, in addition to just preventing the split IOs. We got great results from some of our beta testers too, um, even before Disk Keeper 16 was launched to the wider public. Holger Bertling uh, reported that he was able to save about six and a half hours of storage I.O. time over just 10 days. So here it is, six and a half hours of storage I.O. time saved over just 10 days. One beta tester said, 
Disk Keeper 16 eliminated 32% of my write traffic and cached 64% of my reads to save my workstation over 20 hours of I.O. time in just 24 days of testing. Another said that with Disk Keeper 16, I can tell my workstation is more responsive with no lag or any type of hesitation. So let's take a brief look at how Disk Keeper 16 performed on physical Windows servers. One chap from a global skincare company said that he installed DiskKeeper 16 on his worst performing physical servers running an ERP system with a SQL backend and saw an immediate 50% boost in performance. Uh, David Bruce told us that everything is now more responsive. Andy Vabulous said, wow, watch it go. I can't imagine having a server without it. DiskKeeper 16 is a vastly improved version of DiskKeeper. Now, this isn't your DiskKeeper of old. Victor Grandmeister said that he was amazed by the performance boost. And it is amazing when you remember that we're not adding any additional hardware into the mix. We're just taking an existing computer and optimizing it so that you actually get all of the compute that you've paid for rather than having to waste a percentage of the performance to the excess unnecessary storage I.O. traffic that frankly just doesn't need to happen. Curtis Jackson said, Disk Keeper 16 with DRAM caching doubled our throughput so we could back up in half the time. Uh, a top New York clothing brand reported their backup times improving. They were using a combination of Veeam and Backup Exec, and DiskKeeper dropped their backup times by more than half. Um, we've got quite a lot of case studies to, to read on our website, and I know that some of these, uh, I know we were sort of mainly talking about physical Windows systems today, and, and some of these case studies are, are from customers using our software in virtualized environments, but you'll get the idea. I won't bore you by reading out all of these, but I will pick out a couple of my favorites. Um, Christus Health on the top left over here. Um, let's move over there. Um, they were about to pull the trigger on a $2 million NetApp storage replacement. They had virtualized their medical records application and, and performance was really starting to suffer as a result. They tried our software first and we were able to reduce the reliance on their existing storage so much and give them back the performance they needed that they actually canceled the NetApp purchase order. Now, the account rep at NetApp was really cross as I'm sure you can imagine. Um, another one, Bell Mobility, uh, down here on the bottom left. They saw that they were able to reduce storage IO traffic to their SAN by 61%. And that gave them SQL queries that were three times faster. Over here, um, payroll reports at Stock, uh, Stockport College that used to take one and a half hours to run now take only 10 minutes with our software. So there you have it. We, we are no longer a defragmentation company. DiskKeeper is no longer a simple defragmenter. We want you to not take our word for it, but to experience it for yourselves. We are so confident that you will love DiskKeeper 16. We will give you your money back if you're not completely satisfied. If you want to try DiskKeeper 16 on a wide scale first, we can provide you with DiskKeeper free to try for 30 days. And um, everybody that's attending here today is also going to receive a free NFR or, or not for resale copy, which is the full version for you to run on your system. Try it for yourself and, and see what you think. Um, so, yeah. I, Thank you very much for listening. I hope this has been useful, and, and I look forward to speaking with you all again very soon. Let me just see if we've had any uh, any questions that have, have come through. Um, let's see. Oh, somebody having trouble with the uh, audio. Um, perhaps you can't hear me, but uh, don't don't worry because uh, this is being recorded, and, and a link will be sent out to everybody. Uh, let me find the Q&A box. Here we go. Let's see if we've got any questions here. Okay. Okay. So, say, uh, who's this? Uh, Bernard uh, Borgo said safety for VMs. Yes, it is. It is very, very safe. Um, now, 
the, the RAM cache is only caching read IO traffic. We're not trying to cache writes. So any data that we hold in our cache is also held on the disk. So even if there was a, a catastrophic system failure or if somebody tripped into the data center and pulled the power cord out, the data is absolutely safe. We are not trying to cache write IO traffic in uh, volatile DRAM. Um, so Ilko Acker says, uh, what about uh, RDS, remote desktop services? Yeah, if, you, if you're remote desktoping into uh, a VM in a, a VDI type environment, get Velocity or Disk Keeper onto those machines and we can improve the performance. Even if they are non-persistent machines and they get wiped out at the end of each day, you can add our software to the gold image and every time you clone a machine, then the software will automatically be there and it typically starts providing performance benefit in as little as a, a couple of minutes. Um, Axel Mertis says, does Disk Keeper 16 only do read caching or also write caching? So it is only read caching. Now I'll let you into a little secret. We do have a technique which we've kept in-house at the moment for write caching as well. Um, we're not ready to release it to the public yet, but it does work very well. And it's really going to be intended for machines that definitely have a battery backup because of this issue of uh, data integrity. And what will happen is the data will be written into the uh, RAM cache and down to the storage at the same time. And whichever one can acknowledge it first will acknowledge it, but that's why we need to make sure we have that battery backup. So that will be coming in a future version of Velocity uh, probably at some point next year. But for now, we're only caching reads. It's 100% safe. Um, Right. Is RDS supported? Uh, yes, it is. Um, Simon Bonnet says, how does the caching work? I, what resources do I have to have or allocate on a PC or server to ensure optimum performance? Great question. Um, so the software by default will use up to half of what Windows reports as available physical memory. Okay, so we're very careful not to compete with anything else that's running for memory resource. Uh, the cache is dynamically sized, so it can grow and shrink depending on the needs of everything else that's running. So if you start up a new process that needs a new working set of pages of memory, we will shrink our cache ahead of time and hand those pages back to non-page pool for them to use. Um, as a general rule of thumb on an average Windows server, I recommend to have three or four gig of available physical memory. That would give Velocity roughly a two gig cache size to work with, which because of the efficiency of our telemetry algorithms is enough of a cache capacity to show you a, a really good return on that memory investment. So I hope that answers that one fully. Um, so Bernard says, uh, looks nice, thanks, you're, you're welcome. Um, does Disk Keeper 16 work in a virtualized environment as well as physical? Phil Bayliss said that in. Oh, hi, Phil. How are you doing? Uh, we spoke before in the past, I remember. Um, yes, it does. You can use Disk Keeper on a virtual machine or a physical machine. However, in a virtualized environment, if you've got more than six VMs running on a physical host, it actually starts to become more economic to look at the Velocity software, where instead of licensing it per machine, you license the host hypervisor, um, and then you can put Velocity onto as many virtual machines as you want. So instead of having to pay for each virtual machine, um, yeah, you just license the physical host and put the software onto as many machines as you want to host. And typically today, an average hypervisor might have 20, 30 machines, maybe even more if it's a, if it's a big one. So that works out more economic. Um, so, uh, Simon says, does this work well with Autodesk, AutoCAD, and Revit? Yes, any storage hungry application is going to benefit by having to rely less on the storage. Um, okay, so Axel says, as a long term user of RAM caching before, uh, Primo Cache Server, forgive me, I'm not familiar with that particular one. Uh, do I have control over the caching algorithm, like read ahead caching? 
The short answer is no, you don't. Um, I mean, there are things that we can do as engineers in-house to pin certain things to the cache, but really you don't need to. The algorithms are smart enough to work out what needs to be in the cache and when. Um, we've got a, a whole different raft of different algorithms. So we have a read ahead algorithm, we have a reactive algorithm, which will recognize if you're hitting a common set of clusters often in a short period of time, and it'll make sure that stuff gets put into the cache. And we use this telemetry technique to learn over time what type of applications are in use, what type of files are being accessed, what type of IO streams are being generated, and at what times of the day, the week, the month, the quarter, so that we can become really intelligent about what data needs to be in the RAM cache and when, and how to size those IO packets. Generally, larger IO packets equals more efficiency and better performance, but actually not in every single case. Some applications work better with smaller packet sizes, but the telemetry takes the time to learn what's going to give you the best performance for that particular application. And if the workload changes over time, well, our software will automatically adapt to those changes just to make sure that you're always getting the most performance you can out of the infrastructure. Um, so Elko Aka says, our SQL 2012 is virtualized um, using Hyper-V. Uh, install on the host or the virtual machine? Again, good question. Um, where you, you could install it onto uh, the, the physical host, onto the Hyper-V server, but I wouldn't recommend it. My recommendation would be to install it onto the virtual machines that you're hosting on that hypervisor. The reason for that is because that's the layer at which the right IO traffic gets split. If you're trying to uh, put our technology into the, uh, the, uh, the host layer, it's too late. The IOs have already been split. You can't then prevent them from being split. Whereas if you put the software into the virtual machine, we can prevent the IO from being split in the first place so that everything below that point, including the physical host, is worked less hard. I hope that makes sense. Um, so Phil Bayliss says, why hasn't Microsoft included this technology already in Windows? Well, actually, they have gone some way. There, there is a, a caching technique already in Windows. Um, the benefits that I've shown you in, in the deck are in addition to and over and above the caching that's already there in Windows. So we're not disabling the Windows cache in any way. We are providing extra cache to make it work even better. Um, so... Will Velocity speed up even machines with SSD? That's a great question from Fernando Santos. Um, yes, yes it will. Um, in fact, I've got a copy of DiskKeeper running here on my laptop that I'm using to talk to you right now. Um, this is uh, a Dell XPS 15. It's a fairly beefy laptop. Um, it's got 16 gig of RAM. Um, uh, I think it's, uh, a, so it's an i7 processor, and it has only got SSD storage in it. So this is my copy of, of Disk Keeper. So let's have a look see what's been going on on the, on the last seven days, the last week. So I've saved nearly five hours of storage I.O. time in the last week, just from doing presentations like this, email, writing documents, um, accessing CRM and other documents. Um, I've eliminated over 5,000 IOs from having to go out to my SSD. 66% of my read IO traffic has come from the RAM cache rather than having to go out to the SSD. And 31% of my writes have been prevented from having to go out to the SSD. This means, as I said, over the last seven days, I've saved over four, nearly five hours worth of storage IO time. So the short answer is yes, it absolutely does work with SSDs. And another a uh, happy byproduct of what we're doing is that we're helping to reduce the number of erase write cycles that you get on SSDs. And by doing so, that can help to extend the life of those SSDs as well. So I hope that answers that one. Um, so 
uh, Axel says, he's written a fairly long question. Let me try and get my head around this. <laughs> Will it cache anything written immediately to RAM as well? In our 3D animation and film production environment, we do usually write a lot of files of an image sequence in concurrent and non-sequential order by a render farm and want to access that sh uh, straight away, I guess that is. Um, we won't recache stuff if you're um, putting it into you, into the application's own RAM cache. We're only caching data that would be on mountable attached drives, mountable attached volumes. I hope that answers that question. If I haven't got that quite right and if I've misunderstood the question, Axel, maybe rewrite it for me and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll take a look. Uh, Christian Pauls says, is it compatible with ESXi? So that's the uh, hypervisors from VMware. Um, yes, it absolutely is. Because we are installing the software into the guest Windows virtual machines that are being hosted by that physical ESXi box, and we're not bypassing Windows in any way, it's still a, a standard Windows write driver creating a standard NTFS IO packet and sending it out down through that physical host to the storage, it absolutely is compatible. And in fact, we are a, VM, a VMware Technology Alliance partner as well. So we have a pretty good relationship with VMware. So yes, it is compatible with ESXi. Uh, Charles Rea, hi Charles, another one I've spoken to recently. How does this keep a vary to velocity on a physical machine? Good question. Um, so the both products share the same code base. So feature-wise, they're pretty much the same. Diskeeper is our brand for, that's really intended for physical machines, so physical Windows servers, workstations, laptops, and Velocity is more intended for the virtualized environment. They have two separate uh, management consoles. The, you, you can use Diskeeper and virtual machines, as I, as I mentioned earlier on, but where you start having more than six or seven VMs on a, a physical host, it becomes more economic to go down the velocity route. Feature-wise, it's the same. You have the RAM caching, you have avoidance of those split IOs, um, and so we can improve the performance both ways. Uh, so Billy Stevenson says, what versions of Windows Server will it run on? Good question. So. It is designed for Windows 2008 R2 and later, up to and including uh, 2016. If you have earlier operating systems, so if you've got 2008 but not R2 or Windows Server 2003, we can provide you with uh, previous versions, but the previous version, which was Diskeeper 15, does not have the RAM caching in it, okay? Uh, so Paul Lissett says, does Diskeeper work with Linux, i.e. CentOS? So at the moment, no, we don't have this technology for Linux machines, I'm afraid. It is something that's on our roadmap. Um, I don't know when it's likely to be released to the public, unfortunately, but as of today, we don't. However, if you have a mixed environment where you have some Windows machines and some Linux machines that are sharing the same storage, and you're putting our software onto those Windows machines and reducing the amount of storage IO traffic that's having to be dealt with by the storage, the Linux machines will take advantage of, of that by default because the IOQ depths will be less, there'll be more storage IO bandwidth available and so on. So we can indirectly benefit those Linux guys if they're sharing the same storage resource as the Windows machines. I, I hope that answers that. Um, so, Karsten Holler says, are there any benefits for SSD-based storage systems? Yes, there are. Um, I don't want to over the pudding, but as, as I mentioned before, my machine that I'm talking to you on now only has SSD storage. In the last seven days, I've saved nearly five hours of storage I.O. time. If I had a spinning disk in this laptop, that would probably be even more because obviously spinning disk is slower than SSDs. So absolutely, it is beneficial to, to use it on SSD-based storage systems. Now, if you think about it, I think I've mentioned before, the, the, the RAM cache, that RAM, DRAM, it, it's 10 to 15 times faster than, than flash and SSD. So yes, absolutely beneficial. Um, 
So, Nakmetin Chura says, what's the difference between disk keeper and velocity? You mentioned both in your presentation. I, okay, I, I did try and answer that. It's um, Velocity is intended for the virtual environment. Disk keeper is intended for the physical environment. You can run disk keeper on VMs if you want to, but usually it's more economic to go with velocity because you license the physical host rather than doing it doing it on a per machine or per instance basis. So if you have more than six VMs running in your host, velocity actually works out cheaper for you. Uh, Elko Aka again says, should we configure SQL Server to use less RAM so that there is enough for the DRAM caching? SQL is now using almost all RAM. Great question, and this is one I come up against many, many times. Short answer is yes. Um, SQL has its own form of caching or uh, called buffering, um, and it's not terribly efficient in most cases. What it's trying to do is load as, as much of its database or databases into whatever available memory there is there, and typically it'll only leave a small amount of, of free memory. It might be a, as little as a few hundred meg, no, or a gig or so, but it typically is, well, it's not so much memory hungry as it is memory addicted. <laughs> so if you cap the amount of memory that SQL can take for itself and leave at least four gig of memory free, that will give Velocity a two gig cache size and you will see good performance gains from that. I remember there was uh, an independent test done um, by one of the independent lab testing companies and they tested exactly this. And they found that on a SQL Server that also had, uh, this was Velocity, they were able to get SQL queries that completed 118% faster than when uh, Velocity was not present on the same infrastructure. So yes, very beneficial for SQL. It is a particular sweet spot for us, but you will likely have to cap the amount of memory that SQL can take for itself, which is not terribly difficult to do. But, you know, a quick quick Google search will we'll show you instructions on how to do that. Um, so how do you eliminate write cycles with no write caching? That's a question coming from Fernando Santos. Good question. What we are doing, in fact, I might have a supplementary slide over here which will help me explain this. Um, yeah, okay. So this is a, a representation of a virtualized environment. This is what you would typically see on day one with freshly created virtual machines and freshly formatted NTFS volumes. You have the writes coming out, uh, and the key thing here is you have the least number of writes, and each one is carrying the most amount of data, so that when they reach the storage controller down here, the data is arriving in nice large chunks at a time, and the storage controller has the opportunity to create nice large sequential stripes across its media using the least number of storage level operations. Now as time goes on and these um, file systems, these NTFS volumes become more mature as you are adding more files, you're deleting files, you're moving files around, you're extending files, the free space on that volume becomes very, very fragmented and, and split up. And the problem tends to become worse over time. So this same amount of IO traffic or same amount of data traversing between application and storage now starts to look like this. And what's happening here is the Windows write driver is saying, okay, I've been given a write to do, so I'm gonna go to the Windows free space cache, find my first available free space extent, and I'm gonna start writing. And then it finds, ah, this free space extent isn't big enough. I don't have enough room. So I'm gonna have to split the IO, go back to the Windows free space cache, find my next available free space extent and continue writing there. And then it finds, ah, I still don't have enough room, so I'm gonna to have to split the IO again, go back to the Windows free space cache again, find my next available free space extent and continue writing there and repeat and repeat and repeat until it's been able to write that, all of that data out and send it down to the storage. So you know, a gig of data that should take you maybe three or 4,000 IOs to complete, might now be taking you 30,000 or 40,000 or maybe even 50,000 IOs to complete. That's a lot of extra additional overhead for the environment to have to deal with. It's working much harder than it needs to. So how do we avoid these excess unnecessary writes? We 
sit as a very thin storage filter driver just above the, the Windows right driver and we say, hey, right driver, put that right here on the NTFS volume where there is a large enough area of free space to put that data into without having to split it up or split it up the least. And that's how we can reduce the number of IO packets that are required and send data down to the storage that now looks more like this rather than this. So that involves a lot less overhead and is a much more efficient way of getting that data down to the storage. And it allows the storage to become more efficient because it's able to create these larger stripes using fewer storage level operations. So I hope that answers that question. So we're not caching writes, but we are preventing these excess unnecessary writes that cause overhead and just actually don't need to happen. So, uh, oh, I hope I can pronounce this right. Uh, Evgeny Moskvin, um, how does DiskKeeper work with CSV volumes, uh, cluster shared volumes? It works absolutely fine. In fact, there's on our website in the in the tech support section, there's um, a little write up on that, which I won't go into right now. But yes, it does work fine with cluster shared volumes. Now, um, if you have an active passive type cluster, then it's absolutely fine. All features will be turned on. If you have an active active cluster, DiskKeeper will recognize that and it will disable the RAM caching. Um, to maintain safety. You'll still get benefit from uh, preventing those split IOs, but it will turn off the RAM caching to make sure that it stays safe on an active, active cluster. Um, right, so Axel says again, you said you do not do write caching. How did you eliminate writes on the SSD without having at least a small deferred write cache to combine multiple writes and protect the SSD thereby? Okay, good question. There is a technology in the product called Hyperfast, which is specifically designed for direct attached SSDs. So it'll recognize an SSD. And what it does is it basically says to the write driver, all the small areas of free space, all the small free space extents and the medium sized ones are already allocated, even though they're not. And this forces the right driver to put its right into the larger areas of free space. So that prevents that data from being split up. And that helps to prevent it from writing into these small areas where it's going to need more erased write cycles to occur. So it helps to extend the longevity of the drive and prevent the right performance of that SSD from degrading over time. Because that's the dirty secret with SSDs. The reads will always stay fast, but it's that right performance that degrades over time. If you've got um, a virgin NAND cell in your SSD that's never been written to, you can just put your data into it. But let's say you've got a, a NAND cell that's 40 kilobytes in size and you've written 20 kilobytes of data into it. And now you want to write another 20 kilobytes of data into it. You can't just drop that 20 kilobytes in. What has to happen is that um, that 20 gig that's already sitting there has to be copied out into a buffer. You then have to erase that NAND cell, put the new data with the old data, and then write it back in. So the more of those erase write cycles you have to do, the more the performance will drop down, the more overhead is caused. So by using the hyperfast technology, it will tend to put that data into virgin NAND cells first. And then when all of the large free space extents are filled up, we change the goalposts and say, now all the medium sized um, free space extents are available and so on. So I guess, look, the, 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 the best thing for me to say is to, don't take my word for it. Try it for yourself and see. It works very well with SSDs. Um, we have technology in the product specifically for direct attached SSDs. Um, so Christian Paul says, does the software trigger SSD trim commands uh, by itself or just reduce the IO workload? Actually, both. It can call the SSD trim commands on a, on a periodic basis. It's not, it's not trying to hammer the disk with, with trims but it will do it periodically um, and it will also reduce the IO workload as well. Um, so Ilko Aka says again, is 
the existing data on a server also going to be defragmented or rewritten for optimization, or is it only for new data? That's a great question. So straight off the bat, it will prevent future uh, fragmentation from occurring and, and prevent those split IOs. Now, if you already have a bunch of pre-existing fragmentation, it won't try and do an old school defrag out of the box and, and try and move everything around on the volume to give you a pretty disk. You know, with the size of today's volumes, that is a nonsensical thing to do. There's no point in trying to give you a pretty disk like in the old days where, where drives were measured in uh, you know, a few tens or maybe a hundred gigabytes in size. Now that they are sort of much, much bigger than that, it's pointless. So it takes a more intelligent approach. It'll say, okay, this file I've come across is fragmented, but is that fragmentation performance losing? Is this file being accessed often? If it is, well, then it might defragment just that one file. Okay, it's not running a defrag pass over the entire volume. It's just sorting out that one performance losing file so that it's no longer performance losing. Or it may say, is this fragmented file hindering the free space consolidation? Is it preventing me from creating these nice large areas of free space so that all the future writes can be done more efficiently? If that's the case, then again, it may defragment just that one file. But if those criteria are not met, you know, the file's not being accessed often, well, it's not causing you any performance loss. So we, it'll just leave the file in its fragmented state. It won't try and defragment it and waste system resource bringing those files back together just to give you a pretty looking disk. So I hope that answers that. It does have quite a lot of intelligence in there. Um, so is the existing data on a server also, oh no, sorry, we've gone through that one. Can I only use DRAM caching? Uh, sorry, yeah, so Axel saying, can I only use DRAM for caching or is it possible to use SSD like the upcoming Intel Micron 3D Xpoint Optane, uh, magnitudes faster than today's NVMe SSDs for caching and create a really large cache. We can do this with the other software I mentioned. Great question and interesting point. I don't know how much I'm allowed to uh, give away of our roadmap here. I'll probably get told off for this later on, but I'll, I'll let you guys into a little secret. In the next major release, which is, is going to be coming out next year, yes, you will be able to do exactly that. Um, you'll be able to uh, put an SSD or a flash card in the machine or in a, a, a physical uh, hypervisor and use that as a second tier of caching. So you'll have a, a tiered caching system. So you'll still be able to use idle available DRAM as your tier zero caching strategy, but then you'll have a second tier of cache where you can use a, a flash or an SSD and, and have a larger cache size. So yes, that is definitely coming. And actually I've been playing with that quietly in my lab here as well. So it, it's working really, really well, but we're not gonna release that to the public until next year, but it is, it is coming soon. Um, so Axel says also, can I disable RAM caching if I find it interferes with other caching approaches? We currently use two terabyte SSD cache and 16 gig RAM cache per 32 terabyte RAID volume. Short answer is yes, you can enable and disable the features. Um, it's, it's very easy to do. Uh, if I show you here, so you can turn the caching on or off. You can turn the uh, IntelliWrite technology on or off and, and so on. So you can choose which features uh, you want to use on any given machine. Um, however, if I just flip back here, let me find, there should be a slide, and here we go. Here's a very useful slide because it shows exactly where we sit. But if you have other caching or optimization engines, maybe down here at a physical host server or maybe down here in the SAN, what we're doing up here in the Windows OS is typically very complementary to what they're doing further down the storage stack. Now, we're already offloading a percentage of the reads from here so that less work is had to be done by the cache here or down here. We're optimizing the traffic that does flow out into larger chunks at a time so that, that can be handled more efficiently by the caches down here and down here. 
So what we're doing up here in the Windows OS, we make these other guys look good as well. You know, it's usually very complimentary. Um, but yes, you can turn the features on or off as you wish. Um, so, <laughs> Ilko Aka said, wow, convinced. Brilliant, good man. <laughs> Excellent. Um, you know, if anybody's not convinced, just try it. Try it. You're, you're going to get a copy of the software yourself to, to try personally. We've got this 30-day trial where that we can make available to you. Try it. Don't take my word for it. See what it can do on your machines with your hardware, your applications, your real-world workloads. Please don't take my word for it. Um, so we've got a question here from Phil Bayless. Are there any adverse interactions between, say, AV or Windows disk defragmentation? Um, no, there aren't. Um, when you when you put our software in there, you, the, the Windows disk defragmenter actually doesn't need to work anymore. There's, there's really nothing for it to do. We'll, we will, Disk Keeper will in effect disable it because it isn't needed. It's, it's superfluous. Um, now, uh, 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 perhaps a, a little known fact is that the, the built-in disk defragmenter that's even in Windows today is based on our old Disk Keeper technology from the mid-90s. Now, we have evolved way past that type of technology. That really is sort of reactive old school defrag and I really would urge you not to use that in today's environments if you've got um, environments that use things like replication deduplication copy on write snapshots if you try and do an old school defrag over a, a terabyte sized volume or perhaps even larger that's going to cause an awful lot of overhead to those change block tracking technologies um, you know, it's going to make your nap next snapshot way bigger than it naturally needs to be. And you may have only changed one or two files on the disk since the last snapshot. Um, you know, replication. If every time you move a file around on that NTFS volume to defrag it, that's a block level change that has to be replicated by that deduplication or replication effort. So uh, um, I hope that answers that. Um, and Christian Pauls, which I think is going to be the final question, he says, does DRAM caching work with Windows software RAID? Yes, it does, because it's operating at a much higher altitude than that in the storage stack. So it's absolutely compatible with all levels of RAID um, or you know, Windows specified volumes that you have. That'll be operating lower down the storage stack. We're operating just above the Windows write driver, which writes then down down the stack to the layer where those operate. So I hope that answers all of the questions. They've been uh, quite challenging, some of them. So good work. <laughs> I'd like to be challenged with these. Please look out for your, your copy. If for any reason you don't get it in a timely manner, please feel free to reach out to me directly. Um, as I said before, my name is Spencer Allingham. You can Skype me directly at spencer.allingham. You can email me at sallingham at conducive.co.uk. Um, I hope this session has been useful, and I look forward to speaking with all of you uh, again very soon. Many thanks. Take care.